Welcome to the Paradise Valley Church. We are so glad that you've joined with us this morning. Whether you are a longtime member or a first time viewer, we welcome you. We take this opportunity week after week to pause in these crazy times where one day seems like it's bleeding into the next and there's so much going on and so much confusion. We have this opportunity to pause and think about the bigger picture the bigger story that we might be part of. Maybe you've been wondering about this. Maybe this is your first time checking out a Christian YouTube video or, or Facebook post. And if so, we welcome you here. Today is a special day for us. Our associate pastor, Pastor Chris, will be sharing our sermon as our final time together with him as our associate pastor. He will be moving from here up to Redlands to be the sole pastor of our church up there, and we're so excited for him. And so we are enjoying the fact that this is that day where we get to celebrate the ministry that he has done here among us. We have a very special service today with that in mind, but we also have a really important Vespers that we're going to be doing a little later today at 7 p.m. We're going to be having a in-person, socially distant Vespers where we're going to be closing the Sabbath together and also celebrating the ministry that Pastor Chris has done among us. This will be our first in-person event since March. And so I know that there are many of you who are on a spectrum of comfort levels with everything that's going on. So I want to be very clear to you what we're doing at this event so that we're all clear and if you feel comfortable you can join us. First we're having an event, this event, at the school, the San Diego Academy, in their field. So it will be outdoors with plenty of space. You'll be able to sit wherever you would like, however far you'd like, um, to, to the front or to others as long as you are at least six feet apart. We will be having a screening um, at the front gate before going in. So we will be checking for temperature and we do ask if you've had any COVID symptoms, if you would remain at home. Um, we just wanna make sure that we are providing a space that is as safe as possible for everybody who would like to come. So as you walk in the gate, there will be a screening. We will ask for you to bring your masks, um, bring a blanket if you can. We'll have a couple of chairs set up for those who can't, but if you can bring a blanket for your family to sit on, it'll be an exciting time to be able to see each other. And we invite all of you to come, whoever feels comfortable and be part of saying our celebrating and farewell to Pastor Chris. We do have just a couple of more just brief announcements as well. The first is, there are some of you I know who've been holding on to your tithes and offerings because you wanted to provide them in person. We will have a tithes and offerings box at our Vespers event, so you can bring those there <clears throat> if you've been holding on to it because you'd like to deliver it in person. The second is that we have our scholarship applications for this upcoming school year available now online on our website. So if you have a child in San Diego Academy and you're a member here and you would like to um, apply for that scholarship, you can click on the links that we sent in the newsletter yesterday or you can go to our website and you can fill out the application there. And we'll take the applications and then we'll be um, reviewing it over the next couple of weeks for our school as it starts in the end of August. Finally, we want to share just some additional details about the memorial service and the passing of our dear church member, um, uh, the Gill family and Dr. Francisco Gill. We have shared this with you last week that he um, passed away just a couple of weeks ago. And this coming Thursday, there will be a memorial service for him. We have the details in the newsletter that we sent. There's also um, a space for you to write in electronically gather some thoughts or reflections for Dr. Gill and for the family, of Dr. Gill for the family. We have those details also in our newsletter and also if there's donations that want to be made, they're raising money for um, a specific charity as well. So again, those details are in the newsletter and we'll also put some of them up on Facebook. So if you want to take a look at our Facebook page and you'll, you'll get to know a little bit more 
of those details and we our thoughts and prayers continue to be with the entire family. So we come, as always, to our worship time together with celebrations, with heartache, whatever your story is, whatever is on your heart, we welcome you today. At this time, we like to invite you to greet each other on the Facebook page and our YouTube comments or just text a friend, say happy Sabbath, welcome each other into this time of worship together. Happy Sabbath. Good morning. We want to invite you to sing with us this beautiful song. Loving God, loving each other. Thank you. 
Good morning, Paradise Valley Church. It is now time for our tithe and offering. If you need an envelope, you can stop at the bookstore next door from the church, or you may have gotten one in the mail. Remember, you can mail your tithe and offering in. I'm sure you have the address already. Or you can pay your tithe and offering online. Or you can drop it at the mail slot in the door at church. Thank you so much for your giving already. You've blessed us tremendously. Always remember, your tithe goes on to the conference and from the conference to the World Church and many mission fields. But your offering stays here locally at Paradise Valley, which helps your church. So in your giving, give liberty from your tithe. Let's also give a liberal offering so we can continue to do the work that God has us to do at church. We may think we're not there now, but bills still go on. There's still things that need to be done, things that we are doing. Thank you so much. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the tithe and offering. Thank you for giving to us that we can give back to you. We ask these blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for giving us the opportunity to live one more day. Thank you for the blessings we constantly receive and for Jesus our Savior. This morning we come to you to ask for your help. Lord, we are willing to be used for the advancement of your kingdom. Open our eyes so that we can see the providential opportunities that you are opening before us each day. Teach us to be more sensitive to the people around us. Help us to speak words of hope and encouragement and share your love and truth with those who come in contact with each day. We ask for those who are sick today. We pray that you give them comfort and strength in the knowledge that while they are weak, you are strong. There is nothing too big for you to handle. You are all the hope they need. We ask also that you direct our pastor so that you speak through her. Open our hearts to your message this morning. We ask all this in your name. Amen. Our next song this morning is Side by Side. Let's join our voices together and sing. Join hands to 
memory I have of Pastor Chris is when he spoke at Paris Valley Church for the very first time. I had seen him around. One day he was just there. As he started preaching, he reminded me of churches I had gone to in the past. I kept saying he speaks with a little soul to him. And that's always been my private joke with him. He spoke with a little soul. But I always enjoyed Pastor Chris's sermon. always enjoyed his speaking. And always enjoyed how he delivered the Word of God. So that's my first memory of Pastor Chris was preaching. Memories about Chris, I, I don't even remember when we met. One of the things that has impressed me so much is when you'd come to community services and you'd just stand around and talk with people. I think that building relationships is so important. The first time that Peggy and I remember meeting Pastor Chris and Maeve and his wonderful family was around Christmas time, probably ten and a half years ago. And they had come to visit his parents for Christmas, and uh, we were having church potluck. And uh, we got the opportunity to sit down and, and visit with them for a little bit and get a little bit acquainted. I 
thought what a what a wonderful young couple this is and uh, certainly God is going to use them in ministry somewhere not realizing that it was going to be right here at PV for the next 10 years of their life it was a a great opportunity to get to know this wonderful couple and to to begin to work with them Chris, your mind functions at such a higher level than I can even think. I, I'm no slouch, but I can't even think how your mind functions. And I think that your um, thinking and putting things into words is something that I'm really going to miss. And the other thing is you have such a commitment to your family, and I think that is so neat. Um, you're willing to invest time in them, and, and that's so important. Ms. Phyllis, about Pastor Chris, is his demeanor, his caring ways. Pastor Chris was always there to help me with uh, our prayer warriors ministry. He'd always ask if I need anything. And he also helped me with the Black History Month programs if needed. But whenever I asked Pastor Chris to participate in the program, wherever it was, he always said yes. And I appreciate his kindness in that area. I appreciate his caring ways with all the members. And he'll certainly be missed in a very special way. But this is what I miss most about him, his, his ways of helping others. It's really been a joy working with Pastor Chris and having him on our team. And uh, he became much more than, a, than a, just a team member. He became part of our family. And whenever there was anything that needed to be done, I could always call on Pastor Chris. And he and or his sons would drop whatever they were doing and come and give me a hand. Uh, it's been a wonderful, wonderful opportunity to work with this fine family and get to know them, get to love them, and to serve God together as they have been here at Paradise Valley for so many years. We're really going to miss them. The scripture I'd like to leave with Pastor Chris as he goes to continue preaching the word of God is Isaiah 52, 7. It says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who proclaims peace, who brings glad tidings of good things, who proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. I'm sure Pastor Chris will be preaching in his messages, telling the good news about God. And as he proclaimed the word of God, I'm praying many blessings upon him and his new church. Thank you. When I think about a Bible promise to send you off with, one of the ones that comes to mind is Philippians 4.19, one of my favorites. My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. It's a verse that has served in my life and I'm sure that it will be a good one for you. A text that I would like to give to Pastor Chris and Maeve to, to remember us by, Jeremiah 29, verse 11. This is what the Lord says. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. You had no idea what God's plans were when you came. You just saw the opportunity to come to America and you jumped at the opportunity. God has been with you and God will continue to be with you. He knows the plans he has for you. Just be willing to follow. As he opens the door, as he closes doors, you will see him leading and you will see him guiding your life. Trust God. Let him make the plans for you. God bless.
Valley Church family, this is a special occasion where we get to celebrate somebody who has chosen to dedicate and commit his life to Jesus through baptism. Sammy, we would love it if you could share with our Paradise Valley Church family just why you decided to be baptized. Just share a little bit. Hi everyone, my name is Sammy, and the reason I want to get baptized is because my belief in Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior, and um, I've known him my whole life. Uh, as a kid, I was raised. Uh, my family always uh, taught me. Um, I've, I've always uh, kept the Sabbath um, personal and um, for worship. And um, I just, um, I believe right now it's, uh, it's a good time to get baptized and um, and commit myself to uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Heaven is so glad, Sammy, for this decision. There is rejoicing, great rejoicing in heaven because of this decision. You are of giving, surrendering your life to God, uh, to Jesus. And this is not just for today or tomorrow, this is for eternity. So we are glad, we are so uh, joyful because of this occasion. And church, as you see, there's like Christian folk right there. You know, I was just reminded this morning that we are all fishers of men for the kingdom of God, and Sami is one of them. So I just want to praise God. So Sami, uh, today I I, uh, I will baptize you in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And I pray that God will continue to grow your faith and also to prepare your, uh, your faith for the soon coming of Jesus. And also share the wonderful news about His love, about His salvation, about the story of the cross so that through you, you can bring more people to the church, to the kingdom of God, and not only you, but also your family, hopefully, but also other people whom you will be bringing to the church as well. So uh, we've done this Bible study, we started with Pastor Shelley, and then we started it, carried it over since March, I think, and then until now you are, uh, you decided to give your life to Jesus. So praise God for that. So let me say a prayer. Father God, Heaven is so is so uh, happy. It's there is rejoicing in heaven, Lord, because of Sam's decision. And Lord, uh, it's been a journey with him, doing this Bible study with him. And Lord, he made this decision to fully give his life to you. And this decision, Lord, will last for eternity. We pray, Father. I also pray that may his name be written in the book of life, and that. The, uh, the spiritual journey that he will be facing, Lord. Though there are challenging and tough times ahead of him, may your sufficient grace be always bestowed to him. Father, we pray that this gathering will not just be here today in this place, but our gathering will be in heaven someday. Thank you so much for hearing and answering our prayers. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. For any of you who are watching, who've been thinking about or wondering about whether you want to get baptized, these are strange times we're in, I know. And yet there's always the invitation that Jesus extends to any one of us to commit ourselves to him and to be baptized. And so I want to invite you, an invitation for you to connect with any one of us as pastors if you're interested in being baptized and celebrating this moment together. This morning, I have to say thank you to all of you who partnered with me and Maeve during the 10 years of a very rewarding ministry. My family have had a wonderful and fruitful time with you. I myself have been blessed with your energy and passion in serving God along with others. Your dedication in almost all things 
is the proof of your genuine love to God in which such love naturally compels you to love and accept each other regardless of external differences. We wouldn't forget some key events that we have together that are forever meaningful to us. Standing above others is the annual festival of nations. Yes, you heard that right. In which we are encouraged to display our own cultural identity, but simultaneously convey our spiritual connection with Christ and with its other. We might not have festival of nations together here again, but we are all, if we are all faithful finishers in this race of faith, there is a guarantee that we will be together in the festival of nations in heaven, not just with its other, but with Jesus, our Lord and Savior. That day we will not be wearing our cultural dress anymore, but by the robe of Jesus' righteousness. That day all of us will sing a new song, and together with the angelic voices, we will all erupt in gladness and praises to God, saying hallelujah to the Lamb that was slain. That day we will be in that grand heavenly potluck in which Jesus is the host. That day we will not be holding our flags, but we will be wearing the crown of eternal life. That's for sure. Yes, it's a crown of eternal life. So as you work for earthly things to pay your bills and perhaps save for retirement, Always put in the forefront that the main and the most important goal of each one of us is to make sure we have that eternal crown. The Bible describes this crown in several ways. First Peter chapter 5 verse 4 says, And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. James chapter 1 verse 12 says, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. Paul describes that crown in 1 Corinthians 9 verse 25 as the crown that will last forever, for eternity. Yes, it is the crown that will last forever. Though Paul looks on the day of Christ's coming, to receive this crown, he said that it is already in his store for him. He says, now there is in his store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for its appearing. While we are looking forward to this crown, this crown is already reserved for each one of us. We are already assured of this crown. But at present, we are just going to the process. This process is intense. But at the culmination of this process, the reward is great. Paul describes how he had secured the crown of life. There are two sides on how we can secure this, this crown. On the human side, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 and 8, Paul says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. I will receive this crown on the day of Christ's coming, together with those who long for his appearing. King James Version says, to those who love his appearance. Notice that he talked about what he had accomplished what he will receive, when he will receive it, and who he will receive it with. He has the crown on the coming of Jesus, but not just him, but others as well who are waiting for his coming. It is interesting to note that while Paul is about to appear before the Roman emperor, in which he anticipates that it would be the final lap of his life, Rather than elaborating his incoming suffering, he talked more about what he had accomplished. He accomplished the one main pursuit, and that is the crown of eternal life. And this is because he fought the good fight and remained faithful to Jesus. 
Let us look at how Paul finished his fight. First, he fought a good fight against his flesh. Paul speaks about this struggle in this manner. I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh serve the law of sin. Romans 7 verse 25. You know, a wise person once said, the person I have the most trouble with is the person I see in my mirror every day. Yes, that is true. He said, the law of the flesh keeps fighting against the law of my mind. And unfortunately, the law of my mind brings captivity to the law of sin. Paul spoke that he was powerless, beaten, subdued. His enemy was within himself. But Paul never threw the towel or tapped the cage floor. He was confident because he knew the solution. He didn't surrender because he knew the solution of this. He said, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans chapter 8 verse 1. Friends, anyone who is in Christ is not condemned. Can you say amen to that? However, it does not end there. He said, because you are not condemned by Christ, you know, you now walk according, not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. To fight a good fight, you are not to walk in the road of sin, road of carnality, road of pride, road of idolatry, road of witchcraft, road of hatred, road of discord, road of jealousy, road of fits of rage, a selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. Paul said, I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. On the flip side, to fight a good fight is to walk in the road of love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Second, he fought a good fight against false teachings. Paul fought against the enemies of the cross. He fought against Gnostics and Judaizers. Paul warned in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3, that he fought against false doctrines. He fought against erroneous teachings, either human philosophies or denying the divinity of Christ. Also, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 3, Paul warned against anyone who does not agree to the sound instruction of our Lord Christ and to godly teaching. Two elements. Every good teaching, a sound teaching, should be teaching the, the Lordship of Jesus Christ and live a godly life. He mentions that some had become fallen victim by the false teachers, and thus their faith have suffered shipwreck. That is in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 19. He admonishes to hold fast the pattern of sound teachings which are in Christ Jesus. Paul further warned, the Holy Spirit tells us clearly that in the last days, yes, in the last days, and if you believe we are living in the last days, so am I. Paul warned, some will turn away from the true faith. Friends, I admonish you to not be one of those who will turn away from the true faith. We are in our final days and we will be hearing many teachings. So just be wise to know that not everything that you hear from a preacher's mouth is true. Fact check everybody with what, with what you hear according to what the Bible says and with the teachings of Jesus Christ. Let us make a point here. The truth that we preach as Adventists is the whole truth. It is not a half-cooked truth or a hybrid truth or a halfway truth. It is the whole of the truth that humanity should hear for their salvation. So defend the truth, live out the truth, and share the truth. The, tra the trajectory of the society 
is tilting towards denying God and the Bible. And many preach in intentional deception. And some do not even know that they are already deceived. So we stand against any teaching that denies the existence of God or any philosophy that only promotes the superbness of human intellect, but contrary to the written word of God. Beware as well as you listen to some teachings that mainly promote earthly prosperity without emphasizing the importance of eternity. Third, Paul fought against principalities and powers. For our struggle, he said, is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against the power of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. The spiritual forces of evil was the power that took away all, for example, Job's property, family, and health. This is the power that when he comes after you, he will trample you, he will leave you empty-handed, he will leave you subdued and beaten. Satan sows the seed of tears in the farm of wheat. We know that in the parable of Jesus. He creates and inflicts pain in us. When things are calm and good, he is there to hurt us. He creates chaos in calmness. I am not conclusive, but this pandemic is proving to be the work of the power of darkness than of light. Why? Here it is. It is because it, it's disrupting church gatherings and worship. And it threatens the momentum of gospel proclamation and ministries that is meant to reach the community. I am keenly observing how this crisis will unfold. This crisis comes from two sources we know. Could come. If it is from God, it is because He is accomplishing His purpose to call people to repentance. And that people see their need for God. So we have still this mission to proclaim. Calling people to repentance. Sometimes crisis leads people to the cross. However, if it is from Satan, it's still God has allowed it to happen. Like Job's plagues came from Satan, but it was allowed by God. There is no event in the world, I would say, that God is not in control of. So if this is from God, the question is, for what reason? It is for God's vindication. How is God vindicated in crisis? When we pass through intense crises and come up strong or stronger than we were before and faithfully held on to our faith, God is vindicated. God is glorified in the lives of those faithful to Him. God wants us to show to the world that we are faithful to Him not just in the moments of prosperity, but in times of adversity. It is comforting that God is watching us and He offers His help when we need it the most. Without God's help, we'll be losers, but with God's help, we are all winners. Friends, I want you to take comfort in these words in Scripture. Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, verse 31, now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. In John chapter 14 verse 30, it tells again about the defeat of Satan. I will not say much more to you. For the prince of this world, referring to Satan, is coming, but he has no hold over me. In John chapter 16 verse 11, Jesus said, The prince of this world now stands condemned. So friends, in our struggle against spiritual forces, we are assured of victory. As Satan does not have hold over Jesus, he surely will not have hold over you and me. Satan is already condemned and is driven out of its grip over anybody who trusts and is faithful to God. Satan is great, but God 
is greater. The crisis is great, but God is greater. I don't want to say that your suffering and pain is not great, but God is greater. Satan prowls like a roaring lion over you, but when he meets Jesus in you, he trembles. Having Jesus, however, doesn't leave us to be idle and disengaged. There are necessary steps to be taken. In Ephesians chapter 6, verses, 30, verses 13 to 18, Paul says, Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. Stand firm then with the belt of truth, Buckled around your waist with the breastplate of righteousness in place. And with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God. And then he said, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for, for all the Lord's people. So picture yourself, friends. You are covered with the full armor of God. You are carrying that. You have the belt. You have a breastplate, you have the boots, you have the shield, you have the helmet. Then you are praying and praying for yourself and for others. That is why you are called as the prayer warriors. Do not just pray for the sake of praying. You pray while you are wearing the full armor of God in you. Prayer alone does not guarantee victory. You might pray 100 times but only gather 10 positive results. Why? Because you pray yet you are without the full armor of God in you. In your battle against sin, against self, against Satan, it is important that you pray while you wear the full armor of God. These are the biblical prayer warriors, by the way. This means that you have the truth in Jesus, you have the righteousness of Jesus, the gospel about Jesus, the faith of Jesus, the salvation from Jesus, and the word of God, which is Jesus. That's very important. I say this to you when you have this full armor of God and you are praying to God. Satan trembles on you even before you say the first word in your prayer. When we think about armor, we think of heavy pieces that a warrior wears. Yes, that's true. This armor might be too heavy for us to carry. But the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit in us helps us to carry the armor of God. The truth is, we cannot have the full benefits of Jesus without the Holy Spirit in us. Friends, if you all have these elements, it will help you win this fight. This is what Paul meant when he said, I fought a good fight, I finished the race, and I have kept the faith. In human terms, it is narrowed down to having the full armor of God in Christ Jesus in you. You might lose a single battle here and there, but it does not mean that you would lose the war. Jesus conquered and Satan is condemned. We know that. Ultimately, Jesus will win the war against all forces, and everyone who will not deny and abandon him will be winners as well. I am saying this because I want to leave you the syllabus of Gospel 101. Jesus, Jesus, and Jesus. In life, you might be lose something, but in Jesus, you will regain everything someday. Jesus is on our side. Jesus, the commander of the Lord's host, is in you. By faith, He is in you. Now, I don't want to dilute that with the thought that a mere profession of faith in Jesus without sincerity and uttermost dependence on Him will do it. No, it wouldn't do it. No. Remember, there is a fight. There is a struggle. We are fighting. This is a struggle. 
and most of the time, it daily is travel. This is a controversy, friends. It's not a happy-go-lucky way in the pursuit of salvation. It's not like you said, I believe in Jesus and, and that's it. Using the material paradigm, we are not born billionaires. Remember, we are not born righteous, but we are born sinners. Since we are born sinners, our strong tendency is towards committing sin. We often tilt towards our vulnerabilities. So we need constant dependence on God and an ongoing and daily grace of God in the presence of Jesus to refresh us and empower us. So that is on the side of man. How to win the fight. Now on the side of God, listen carefully. Jesus said in Luke chapter 22, verses, verse 32, But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. I believe that like Peter, Jesus prays for us in the moments of our greatest struggle and weakness, or even to the lowest moment of our lives. Christ prays for you. Get this. In that very moment when Peter denied Jesus, in which this verse was written, Jesus responded to that denial by saying, I have prayed for you that your faith may not fall. Jesus said to those who were given salvation, My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. Yes, friends, no one can snatch away, uh, um, snatch us away from Jesus. What a comforting words it is. And I want to say amen to that. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, Paul declares, For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill His good purpose. For sure, we have a share of work to do, and that is to display to the whole world that we are saved by the grace of God. The Bible says, work out your salvation. You are the spectacle of God's grace, friends. You are a written epistle. So display it, not in a self-righteous manner, but display your salvation in humility. Good works are revealing the glorious character of Christ to others. You are the written epistle. Though this seems like a lofty goal, it is not impossible to achieve because the Bible says, God works in us both to win and to do His good pleasure. There is another wonderful truth that I want you to hear, that the Lord God holds us. When a crisis comes, a pandemic of this magnitude, all are affected in one way or another. Some of us are going through it so intense. And to say that this crisis affects everyone is not an overstatement. I am not honest to you if I will say I, I am not personally concerned or worried with what is happening. Yet a beautiful verse in Psalm 20, 75 verse 3 says, When the earth and all its people quake and tremble, remember, it is I, the Lord says, who holds its pillars firm. Oh, how amazing and strengthening. Even when we are shaken because of a crisis like this, it is the Lord who holds us firm. Amen. So Jesus prays for us. God works in us and God holds us. Again, I repeat that. Jesus prays for us. God works in us and God holds us. That is what God does so that we will win this fight. We have everything that we need. We only don't have the supplies. We have the supplier of strength and power. So let us all be faithful finishers for the crown that is in store for us in heaven. We can do it because Jesus prays for us. God works in us. 
and the Lord holds us. The crown of life is already in store for us. It has been secured. What we are going through is just a process ending towards that grand culmination, that grand ending, when we receive the crown of eternal life. It was inspiring to hear Paul, who even though he was suffering and under a severe crisis of life and was facing death, he was confident to say, there in a store for me, a crown of life. He hasn't received the actual crown yet, but he knows that there is a crown reserved for him. It is because he knew that he was faithful to God up to the end. I pray that like Paul, even though we are experiencing tough challenges of life and faith, in this life, that we are under this, that we, while we are under this intensifying crisis and are in moments of life's uncertainty, that we can confidently say, I too, like Paul, will have that crown of life on the day Christ appears. We can confidently say that I have fought a good fight, I have finished the race, and remain faithful to Jesus. So friends and family, in Jesus, I want to encourage you to press on, move forward, do not give up. Jesus is on, on our side. Jesus wants us to be forward looking. Jesus wants us to be confident right now of what we can be in the future. Jesus wants us to possess right now what we will possess in the future. We can have that confidence right now if we are faithful to God in heart, in spirit, in mind, and in strength. So let us all be faithful finishers because Jesus is coming. Let us all be faithful finishers because Jesus is coming again as the song says. Let us all be faithful finishers because we are nearing home. Let us all be faithful finishers because the coming King is at the door. Let us all be faithful finishers because the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time will be no more. Let us be faithful finishers because it is how, how great is our God. Let us be faithful finishers because when time comes that it seems there is no way that God will make a way. When it seems there is no way, God will always make a way. Yes, we have many choices. We have many choices to make. But what a beautiful song to learn and to hear that God will always make a way. Thank you so much, Brother Arnell, for that song. But add to these songs are these beautiful verses. In Matthew 24, verse 13, Jesus says, But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 12, says, Press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of us, and that is eternal life. Revelation chapter 3, verse 11, Jesus says, I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown away. So friends, to end, please allow me to say that for the past 500 summits plus, I have been with you, we've been with you. I take it with pure joy and pride every time I say, you are my church family. Paradise Valley Church is exceptional. It is not because your name is Paradise, but you actually live out the elements of living in Paradise. It was not perfect, as you can find a perfect church, but there is that evidence of love and unity among you. Yes, for the past 10 years, you have been our church family, though in spirit that remains true, and our universal brotherhood and sisterhood in Christ continue to remain the same. It is the reality that in ministry, 
you have to move when God calls you to move. After the Sabbath, me and my family will move to a new church. A church which we feel God is calling us to serve Him. We are not leaving because we are burned out. Absolutely not. We are not leaving because there is more salary there. Absolutely not. Pastor Shelley knows that pastor salary in Redlands area is lower than in San Diego. We are not leaving you because we don't want to suffer along with you in this crisis. Absolutely not. The church we are going to is, always, is also experiencing the same crisis as you. We are not leaving because of convenience. No, God's calling is not an avenue of convenience. We are living because of the only reason that we sense God's call to serve Him in that church. The great side of this is, what you, is that you equip me and me, my family, to be better prepared for this call. You ministered to us as we have ministered to you. We felt your love and abide in us even in our frailties. You make us feel the joy of being accepted. And now we are ready to accept everyone, regardless of culture. Yes, I got it. It is not a good time to live while the church service and worship is on pause. And when the church is struggling and is looking for someone to help the pastoral staff to stabilize, strengthen, and encourage the faith of members in times like this. It is not a good time to live in a critical situation or when faith of many is tested because of a crisis. It is not the right time to leave your church family when she is fighting to survive. It is not a good time to leave your team during a timeout, I would say, or during the last two minutes of the game, or in a critical period of the game, or during finals or Super Bowl or a World Series. It is not time to leave. But church... This is not like sports, where you compete against each other to get the prize. We don't compete against each other, nor we race against each other. When Paul used the race metaphor, he wasn't thinking about sprinting against each other. He was thinking about a marathon where everyone who finished the goal is rewarded. We have the same goal and the same mission, and that mission is to win with each other and to win for its other, and to win others for Christ. Let me repeat that. Our goal and mission is to win with each other, with other people, with other church members, and to win for its other. What I win is for you, and to win others for Christ. We are still in the same team, with the same goal, with the same mission. And hopefully, when the time comes with the same glory, we all work not for its individual glory, but for the glory of God. It is not for the individual glory of a church, but it's for the glory of God. The church works only for the glory of God. Paul was taken out from his church, so was John and Peter and James, but his spirit is still dwells in his church. So at this juncture, I want to say thank you to all of you. I wish I can say all your names and all the ministry leaders, members, and cultural and ministry groups in this great church. Forgive me if I can just mention just a few, however. Since our children are so precious to us, I want to say thank you to the Pathfinders leadership. You are great. And to the Adventurers leadership, I would say you are great. To the children's ministry team, you are great. And of course, the exemplary and awesome youth leadership in this church, you are so great. You help us in big ways that shape our kids' future, not just for earthly things, but heavenly. I want to say thank you to all the wonderful cultures in this church. But again, I beg your understanding, if you may. If I will just say a few words to say thank you to the Filipino group, who in the beginning are instrumental in bridging me and my family to the church. 
that first step resulted in this call. And also, I want to say thank you to the previous and present pastoral leadership that I served with. I was humbly honored in having a chance to serve God along with you. Above all, thank God for allowing us to serve you along with the other pastors. To end, let me share with you one final story, something that I was able to accomplish with the help of God in this church. And this is memorable throughout my lifetime and ministry. One of the great things I can forget about PV Church is that I was able to earn my Doctor of Ministry degree while I was with you. After finishing the fourth year of my study, I am about to give up. I finished all the coursework, all the pre-intensive readings, the post-intensive readings. Pastor Shelley knows about them. With your permission, I was able to go to Andrews two to three weeks in a year to attend my cohort classes. In four years, there were lots of difficulties and readings, class projects, interviews, and whatnot. But it is not those classwork that would ultimately earn me the degree. It was writing the main paper, or a doctoral paper. It was the final test of the doctoral candidacy. It was the finishing touch of the doctoral process. I was almost like other students who have finished the classworks but are not able to write or finish the doctoral paperwork. At many times, I wrestled with the thought of not writing and just call it quick. At times, I feel like I don't want to write or I don't know what to write or I am busy with other things to write or just, I am just plain exhausted. I am not motivated at all. Or I have doubted myself if I can just write a big paper like this. Until one day, I decided to write. Whatever it takes, I said to myself, if I will not write, I will not earn this degree. And all my money, my time, my effort, my readings, and course writings will be nothing. What I have started will turn nothing if I will not write. Even though I started yet, if I don't finish with the writing, all my efforts are useless. After reflecting, I said to myself, I am going to write. I asked God to help me to write. I said to myself, just write and finish this final project. And God, and God will take care of the rest. Praise God, with His grace, with your support, I was able to finish and earn the degree. Praise God and thank you. So in our spiritual journey, we might come to the point that we are exhausted or busy with other things, or we don't know what to do, or we don't have energy to finish to the end, or not motivated to finish that one final test. There will be big discouragements and doubts in our Christian life. It is a good start, but be sure not to end where you started. Again, I repeat that. It is, a, it is good to start, but be sure not to end where you started. Be sure to progress in faith and finish this race faithfully. Be sure that when you start, you will finish. I say, just finish to the end. Just finish the race, and God will take care of the rest. For 10 years, it was a wonderful journey with you, again, I repeat. And now we will be separated in the jurisdiction of ministry. But it is my sincere appeal and prayer that all of us will be faithful finishers of faith. And we will all be in that heavenly festival of nations. That's my prayer. So may God bless you in faith. And may He sufficiently supply you with His grace, and that you and we as family are faithful finishers to the end. It is my prayer. Amen. Let us pray. Father God, I want to pray for this very dear church family. 
I want to pray for the Paris Valley Church. I want to praise you, Father, and glorify you with the years of service and ministry in this church. It's a gift that you alone can get. Thank you, Lord, for their love, for their support, and for how they shaped me and my family to be better prepared as we go to another church. But it is my prior prayer, Father, as I love them and as you love them so much, that may you help them to endure to the end, that they will say, along with me, when you come for the second time, that you are our God, whom we are waiting. So Lord, I pray with the sincerity of prayer that may they continue to fight a good fight, that they will finish the race, and that they will remain faithful to you, that they will never give up in faith, so that one day when you come for the second time, you will give that crown of eternal life to each one of us, and it would be a joyful day for all of us. Because it's not only Paul, it's not only for this church, it's only for me, also for me and the church where we are going and to everyone in the world who are waiting for your son return. So help us, Lord, to be faithful to the end. This I pray for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen.